Have you ever seen a tofurkey in the wild? Come explore the brand with a funny name that pioneered the fastest growing food trend and helped launch a plant-based phenomenon. Learn how this earth-friendly movement is changing the way we eat. At Brand Secrets and Strategies, you learn how to save valuable time and money, where you learn strategies to get your products on more store shelves and into the hands of more shoppers, empowering brands and raising the bar. Welcome. Today I've got a special treat for you. I think this is going to be one of the best interviews I've ever had. Today I talked to Seth with Tofurky, and what's great about today's interview is this is exactly why I do this. To talk about thought leaders that are disrupting the category. People that started out on a mission to create a product and change the way we think about healthy food. More importantly, the mission that he has behind his products and how that mission carries forward to everything that he does within his company. And how Tofurky carved out a unique category, created a category at retail, and gave retailers the opportunity to serve customers that were being ignored previously. A lot of customers are looking for plant-based products. Not necessarily all vegans, flexitarians. This is a group of customers that are driving sustainable sales across every category by looking for unique products, looking for products that are plant-based. Is learning about an alternative protein source, something made from plants. And it says, says we're cutting out the middleman. And one of the reasons this matters so much, whether you're an animal rights activist or not, is because when you feed an animal grain or hay or things they're not supposed to eat, or a lot of water to get milk, you feed that animal a lot more than you get back in return. You're definitely going to enjoy this episode. This episode is one of my new favorites. One of the things we talked about is how brands need to go to market. A different way of financing your brand that's not what we necessarily teach at the natural products business schools or natural products expos, etc. It's all about grit. It's all about stick to and how you can, with the right mission behind you, change the world. In this podcast episode, you're going to learn what Seth did, the disrupted category. These are simple strategies that you can adopt. And if you stick with this, and if you have the right kind of mission in mind, and you can bring the right people into your circle, into your community, you can change the world. This is what we need to celebrate more in the natural community. Instead of focusing on velocity, instead of focusing on a lot of the metrics that really overlook what makes natural natural, this is what's important. In other words, the customer you bring into that retail store is far more valuable to the retailer than a lot of the other things you're expected to pay for, different promotions, etc., that do nothing to help the retailer compete more effectively in their market. We'll cover a little bit more about that in this episode and other podcast episodes. As always, I want to thank you for listening. This show is about you and it's for you. In appreciation for your time, there's a free downloadable guide for you at the end of every podcast episode. I always include one easy to download, quick to digest strategy, one that you can instantly bake into your brand's DNA to help you gain a significant competitive advantage. Remember, the goal here is to help you get your product onto more store shelves and into the hands of more shoppers. And don't forget to go back and listen to previous episodes where I may solve some of your most pressing bottlenecks. And also, don't forget to check out my new YouTube channel where you'll see a lot of the interviews that, that you hear about on this podcast on the YouTube channel as well as a lot of other brand building content. And be the first to subscribe there so you get the new brand building content as soon as it becomes available. Now here's Seth. Seth, thank you for coming on today. Could you please start by telling us a little bit about yourself? I love your story. So I hope you get into it and kind of talk about how your humble beginnings and how you became an overnight success 20, 30 years in the making. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to start. Well, uh, yeah, I'm the uh, chairman and founder of the Tofurky Company, which I started in 1980 uh, as a tempeh company in Forest Grove, Oregon, which is about a half hour west of Portland, Oregon. And I didn't know anything about business. I was a teacher naturalist out of college. That's what I had been trained for. And I, when Ronald Reagan came into power in 1980, a lot of these environmental jobs that I'd been doing were no longer in favor. And so I needed something to do. And uh, I had found Tempe uh, three years ago while visiting the farm in Tennessee, which was a spiritual commune of 1,200 hippies that were eating a vegan diet, although they called it a 
pure vegetarian diet back then. The word vegan really wasn't in use in 1980. So they were pure vegetarians and they uh, had, I was a vegetarian and I had been eating these soy grit burgers, which were just little bits of soybeans that were ground up and I would mash them into a, with a, wheat flour to hold them together and spices and stuff and they didn't taste that great but they did they digested worse <laughs> and they were really tough to eat so i heard about i read about in the farm literature these uh this tempeh product and it was like uh they said oh on the farm everybody loves the tempeh and it's so delicious and very digestible and i was like whoa a soy product that is tastes good and is digestible. I got to get some of this. So uh, I went to the farm and um, that's where I got the starter and I made the first batch of tempeh in Tennessee in the summer of 1977, which is tempeh is from Indonesia. It's a fermented uh, food from Indonesia and Tennessee is very Indonesia-like in the summer. So I made and fell in love with tempeh then and opened up the business in 1980 on $2,500 of my eight-year savings of naturalist money. <laughs> so It's not a lot of money. So let me ask you, so you went to Nashville to, start to try the tempeh? Did I understand that correctly? Well, yeah, I, I got a job. Uh, actually near Greenville, Tennessee, okay. in East Tennessee, uh, teaching in the um, Youth Conservation Corps. We would get high school kids, and I was hired as a environmental ed specialist, so I was teaching them uh, about the environment and outdoor education during the week, and then on the weekends, the kids all went home <clears throat> they were doing work projects uh, in the National Forest during the week and then getting into this environmental education. And we were all living um, on a golf course in these big army tents. And I had heard about the farm that was like five hours away. It's about an hour and a half south of Nashville. And so we, on the first weekend I could, I, I went over there and with a couple of other uh, friends and talked my way into uh, visit, you know, staying overnight there and just um, learned a little bit about what they were doing and got paid three bucks for some of the secret tempeh starter. They had just um, started making tempeh at that point and uh, tempeh, you know, was first discovered by American scientists um, at the university uh, at Cornell University after they noticed in Indonesia that in the World War II the concentration camps over there had uh, the ones that had tempeh in it had a lower incidence of dysentery and a higher survival rate that they attributed to the tempeh because you know, you can cook soybeans on a stove in water for like literally a week and not get them as tender and as digestible as tempeh makes these beans in 24 hours after you've cooked the beans for only uh, about an hour. So, you know, with firewood being really scarce in these camps, you know, you didn't have to cook them so long. You just cooked them for uh, a short period of time relatively and then incubated them and then they became tempeh. So that's where the farm had learned about tempeh was from Clifford Heseltine of the, it was a professor at the uh, Cornell University. And because uh, they grew all these soybeans, they were vegetarians and vegans. And so they needed to feed all these people and so they were feeding them tofu soy milk tempeh and all these uh at the time cutting edge soy products um even uh an ice bean so Interesting. it was an amazing place well okay so tempeh let's talk a little bit about that it's made with ferment with bacteria so where do you get the bacteria and you were talking it's actually about a mold. a mold yeah not okay. a bacteria yeah okay so where do you get it um, we make our own right now, but there's several places. I actually, we still 
you know, on occasion will buy tempeh starter from the farm, which has a tempeh lab, but there's several other labs, tempehsure.com has um, a really good starter, um, and the farm does too, and several other places. So, uh, but tempeh needs this mold um, to grow for like 24 hours after you cook the beans and the mycelium of this mold bind the beans together into this cake so that you can cut tempeh like razor thin really after it's done and it'll stick together whereas tofu you know you can't cut it that thin and you kind of crumble and tempeh has about twice the protein of tofu because you're eating the whole bean and not the milk of the bean and by the way you could make tempeh out of really any grain or bean as long as you remove the hull which is on there to protect the seed from mold or bacteria or anything getting in there and of course with tempeh you want the uh, culture to get in there and pre-digest the enzymes and the proteins and Tempeh is actually one of the highest, uh, easiest um, proteins to be assimilated by the human body. It's, uh, you know, very easy on the system and, uh, and it's, you know, delicious too. It has its own texture and flavor that isn't really, you know, trying to imitate anything. It's just its own unique flavor, but it's uh, just widely consumed and revered all over Indonesia. Um, they make temp tofu in Indonesia too, as they do throughout Asia, of course, before it came to the U.S. But tempeh is very localized for the most part in Indonesia and hasn't really spread out through Asia. And in this country, tofu, the first tofu shop was in Portland, Oregon, Oda Tofu, and that was in 1905. And so tofu has been in this country for a very long time, but tempeh has the first uh, tempeh shop, commercial tempeh shop was in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I think it was 1976. So a lot shorter time and a lot narrower ethnic um, following for tempeh than tofu. Kind of an interesting thing. I'm kind of in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, who thought about putting mold on their food to make it taste better? It's, yeah, I mean, back when it was made. But it's interesting how, from a nutritional standpoint, it provides more nutrients. So, okay, let me dig a little bit deeper. Soy is something a lot of people have trouble digesting. How does that compare to tempeh? Does it, is it easier for your body to d digest it and metabolize it? Actually, yes, and and people that do have um, problems digesting soy, like uh, are often, you know, th there's really two kinds of s major kinds of soy that we call, uh, like we call it, like there's the industrial form of soy, which is the soy protein isolates and concentrates, and sort of like a modern technological form that is actually. Um, you know, they separate the proteins from the starch of the beans with hexane, which is a commercial very, uh, it's, it's an ingredient in gasoline and it goes off when you make the uh, isolates, it um, evaporates, but there's still parts per million and everything. So we tend to go with uh, tofu and tempeh, which are what we call the traditional lightly processed forms of soy and tempeh. Um, you know, being the fermented process really helps the digestion. And I, you know, have a lot of people that um, that do have trouble with the other forms of soy that say, well, tempeh, um, I don't have that same problem with. So it is a more digestible form of soy. I appreciate your sharing that because I know a lot of people that love soy, but do have problems. And, and I love soy, but yet I don't, I do feel fuller heavier sometimes when i drink or eat soy so yeah. i'm gonna have to try i mean i've had tempeh i didn't put the two and two together like that so yeah. that would that's interesting so thank you for sharing that so go ahead well, it's interesting that you say that if i could jump in here yeah know, because um like we make uh a, a tempeh burger that we um make we grow the um beans into the shape of a burger and then we marinate them in soy sauce and garlic and onion and we sell them in food service 
um, it's just a very laborious process. So we, it's hard to scale that up. We had them in retail, but we took them off. But um, when I eat, like I love the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger, but for me, the feeling after eating one of those is heavier, like you describe with soy. Um, but with tempeh, I don't get that feeling at all. It really feels like when I eat tempeh, it just um, feels a lot better in my gut than the more um, the fancier bleeding burger kind of things do that have, I think, more oil and fat in them. So it might be that because tempeh very low in fat. It's like a low fat burger. So anyways, um, just the opposite for me. That's interesting. Well, and since they're made out of, some of them are made out of pea protein, getting way right. off the topic. Um, but yet I know some companies that put pea protein in other things. And, and I think that's, it's thicker, it's globular, sort of like a gluten from a bread. So when you're talking about uh, tempeh and tofurkey, tofu, etc., is that the glue that you guys use to hold everything together? Is that fair to say? Um, well, different products uh, hold differently. Yeah, like tempeh is held together with the mycelium, and with tofu and tofurkey, it's held together mostly with the vital wheat gluten, which is the protein part of the wheat. So, um, and a lot of the uh, products that are like the Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger have gums and different things that hold them together. And that's the cool thing about tempeh is that it's this natural process that just is binding the beans together overnight and uh, keeps them really um, solidified and has a, you know, just a wonderful texture. It does. It does. So mycelium, is that from mushrooms? Yeah, that's like the roots of the mold. Uh, culture. I mean, mushrooms are fungi and molds are right. a different category. And, uh, you know, it's uh, scary to people, but it's actually, you know, a, a very probiotic and a, and a good, one of the good guys to go in your stomach. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful product. They are. And on that note, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the products, not a lot, some of the products that are coming out today, are filtered through mycelium, through mushrooms, effectively. So it removes the bitterness and it changes the taste profile. Where I'm going with that is I wonder how much of an impact that has on changing the the structure from a soy to what you're saying, talking about in tempeh. And where I'm going with that is it creates a, a more neutral flavor that can adopt and a flavor is not the right word, a more neutral palate so it can adopt other flavors, which is one of the cool things I love about what you guys are able to do. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I can't speak to those products filtered um, through that because we don't really use them, although we do use some extracts, you know, like mm -hmm. mushroom extracts and things like that as a flavoring. Um, but, you know, I do think that there's a vast difference between the uh, traditional processed forms of soy, which have been in use and being consumed by cultures throughout the world for centuries and proved themselves to be, you know, healthy and, um, you know, a, a good protein. But, uh, you know, it's a little more, um, you know, I think the juries can still be out on some of the effects of the more industrialized forms of soy. But, um, you know, the, I think that, uh, you know, I'm just an old tempeh guy <laughs> for for starters, just because, um, you know, I just love the, the way that my body feels. And I've seen people just um, really respond to tempeh um, well over the years. Well, and I think it's, it's, thank you for sharing all that. And I was thinking about is the, not you filtering, but a sort of a natural attribute to that. And where I'm going with that is the different flavors that you guys have, how something can assimilate or take on the flavor profile of something a lot easier. Um, and I'm wondering if that has something to do with it. So, and I love what you guys are able to create. So you became a tempeh, a uh, farmer's not the right word, but you started cooking tempeh. Can you talk a little bit about your journey and how you, you know, talk about, 
you lived in a tree house. You, uh, the way you put it together, you made almost nothing for years and years and years trying to build this business up. And then you had the support of the community and stuff like that. Can you talk about that? And the reason I wanted to go here, Seth, is that one of the things that makes natural natural is that we're all working together toward a common goal. And in your situation, you're trying to provide nutrients to people that are that the vegans. You've got a product that is better for the environment, better for the climate, etc. And then you've also you're in a mission. So can you talk about some of that aspect of your your journey? Um, yeah, sure. And, you know, first I want to say, yeah, we're, we love the vegan sector, but there's also you know, the bigger sector. What is really driving a lot of the growth now is this flexitarian, uh, sector, whereas people that are eating like half or more of their meals meatless, um, every day and every week. Um, but yeah, you know, in 1980, when I started the natural history, um, the natural uh, foods industry was really very uh, infant, you know, and it was in its infancy. You really couldn't get many natural foods in 1980 in the supermarkets. It was really kind of confined just to co-ops and natural food stores, which, you know, still is obviously an important base of uh, our sales and in and, and the industry. But there, you know, in order to get like for instance, tofu, you had to go to the co-op. And in 1980, I rented uh, a kitchen <clears throat> at night. It wasn't being used in my local co-op at night. And I paid them $25 a month to be in there from four in the afternoon when they closed the uh, up for the day to seven o'clock the next morning. And so I was able to make 100 pounds of tempeh um, during an eight hour shift of, by myself, which then I took around to the natural food stores in Portland. And uh, Portland at that time had, I mean, Whole Foods actually was just being started in 1980. John Mackey started the same year, 1980, that I did. Um, there wasn't much infrastructure. The natural food stores were for the most part kind of still uh, at dark ages, and by dark, I mean not really good lighting and warped wooden floors, old secondhand um, refrigeration equipment and stuff like that, uh, big bins of grains and stuff. Um, so I uh, cut my teeth, you know, delivering in my three-door Datsun station wagon, which had been in an accident and had been T-boned and the front door, the driver's side door was missing. And I kind of bungee corded a makeshift door just so <laughs> I wouldn't fall out when I was driving. But, um, you know, it was interesting to just not be able to find any plant-based foods. Uh, there was no cheeses, no milks, um, not even tofu in the in the supermarket channel. So you really had to go to the um, the co-ops. Like the co-op that I was working in, what to make the tofu sell? Like they buy it in these great big white five-gallon buckets with which had a plastic bag and it had all the tofu swimming in it. And then the volunteers would reach in there and they'd fish out a cake of tofu and they'd put it in a Chinese restaurant container that they had bought and they'd scribble on it tofu. And so that gives you, you know, the idea of that. And there, the other thing was there were without a category in the supermarkets, there was no, uh, investment banker venture capital community willing to, you know, come over and give me like, uh, a helping hand, um, and invest in my little tempe dream, you know, like I go to these trade shows now and it's kind of thrilling to see like these small startups that just don't really have many sales now, but they have a product are all attracting investment, you know, because it's a hot category and there's people willing to take a chance. Well, there was no category then. So it was really just self-funding 
the business and then my brother stepped in and loaned me like five thousand dollars of his uh retirement savings he had eight thousand dollars and so now i really had to get to work and so that was really nice of him and he's been with me still um this whole way and really been generous before i could go to banks you know i would go to him and i'd borrow money and i'd pay it back and borrow some more so i had a, like a revolving line of credit with my um, brother but yeah the you know the first nine years of making tempe um were really lean years financially and uh i did take home thirty one thousand dollars in the nine years the first nine years that was total and that wasn't 31,000 a year which would have been still tough but anyways uh so not making any money I did a lot of uh creative things I lived in trailers and tents and teepees and built my own tree house and these four trees that I rented for 25 bucks a month also 25 bucks a month seems to be a magic number for mm -hmm. me I don't know why but um you know it was and it was growing and the natural food um sector was growing in the 1980s as well and uh but you know having tempe it wasn't really a unique product because there were other tempe makers there was light life who you may know now um is a uh part of maple leaf foods they started out as a tempe company on the east coast and they learned about tempe at the farm also you know um so there were other tempe makers um throughout the country that were providing uh regional tempe and so i was having trouble expanding you know uh really hitting making enough money to make a profit but, you know, the I was really mission driven. You know, I wanted to see low on the food chain um, proteins that you didn't have to uh, feed through animals, you know, feeding them right to people. And that was kind of my mission. And I um, the mission really kept me going while the money wasn't really there. Um, but, we, but I actually rented out a school building um right 10 miles from where i live right now that was sitting vacant and that became my incubator space and i had a commercial kitchen and a gym and four classrooms that i rented for 150 bucks a month um which was amazing and uh out in the country and it was a little rural school so and we just had some wild times there. We we were selling to the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Have you seen the Wild Wild Country documentary about the Bhagwan? No, I'm sorry, I haven't have to check that out. Yeah, he they were a commune in uh, Oregon in the 1980s, and they oh, were red they clad. They had the followers, and they had bought like an old cattle ranch that was uh, in pretty bad shape from overgrazing and. They were vegetarians, so they were having this big guru festival where they were bringing in all these followers of the Bhagwan to uh, Oregon in 1983. And they came to, and they found me and they said, Can you make us tempeh for this big meal? And so I made them 2,000 pounds of tempeh, which was a huge order. It was about, you know, what I was making in a whole month. And uh, I drove it over there and we watched them cook up which is probably the biggest tempeh meal in the u.s history still but they had ten thousand of their followers um chowing down on turtle island tempeh and uh so that was a big thing and i went back there several other times to deliver um tempeh so they were they were good years you know um it was really when i look back um very enjoyable years you know you don't need a whole lot of money to have a lot of fun and um we rented classroom out to various people including a traveling troupe of circus clowns that tuned pianos when the clowning business was soft which was all the time and uh you know it was just kind of a, a fellini like um life out there in the woods making tempeh and living in a tree and circus clowns running around everywhere um so um, I did that for about, you know, well, till 1990. And in 1990, I started feeling like 
you know, even in spite of the business growing a little bit, I was just questioning whether I was going to be able to turn this around and actually make a profit and, you know, a, a living wage for myself and really, you know, employees. I wasn't really able to pay much of a salary or benefit. You know, we were more like a cottage industry than we were a small business at that point. And so I started to look for a way out. And, uh, you know, one of my projects was by living in the treehouse, I had met all of these other treehouse dwellers. And I started to write a proposal for a treehouse book. And I was going all around the country and um, filming treehouses and writing up stories about them. I had one treehouse that actually turned out to be built by a bank robber who mm-hmm. robbed 40 banks in Seattle. And we were out there filming his treehouse. We didn't know he was a robber. Uh, but that project didn't uh, take hold with a book publisher. I couldn't find a publisher. So I went back to trying to make Tempe. And in 1995, uh, we pivoted to the first Tofurky Roast. Hmm. So you were, it's interesting that you, you didn't, you didn't deviate, but you tried to create a new revenue stream while you're doing this. How did right. that impact the business. I mean, you had people there that were able to still keep doing what you were doing. Yeah. So we were still making tempe. And at that point, um, you know, we were, had moved the business over to hood river out of the schoolhouse and, uh, we had, we were doing better, but still weren't profitable at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry about the phone interruption. No worries. Um, and so, you know, I, I was delivering Tempe one day in Portland to one of my friends, Hans Robel of the Higher Taste, and he was uh, making a stuffed tofu roast for Thanksgiving. This was like October and uh, just before the holiday, and I was like questioning him about it, and he said, oh, yeah, I'm going to sell uh, 50 of these at $50 a pop to uh, some of my best customers and there's a little stuffed tofu roast and gravy. So I bought one and it was good. And I said, you know, let's go into business, Hans. Like, uh, I think this is something that the world is waiting for because as a vegetarian, I had had all these failed Thanksgiving um, treats that we had made. You know, we had a gluten roast that you couldn't cut with a chainsaw that we worked all day on to make. And I had a stuffed pumpkin that collapsed in the oven and it was just a mess. So I always wanted something to eat because Thanksgiving for me as a vegetarian, you know, everybody was like happy Turkey day. And I was like, no, it's not a happy Turkey day for the turkeys or me. So I don't have anything to eat. So, uh, I had remembered that in 1981, when I was delivering to some of the stores in Portland, the tempe, I looked in the cooler and I saw this tofurkey sandwich that was made out of tofu and it was um, basted with soy sauce or something. It wasn't really turkey-like, but it was a clever name, I thought. And I always liked the name, so that stuck in my head. And then 1995, I was like, let's call this tofurkey, which everybody thought was a bad name they were advising me against it and saying it's too funny it's not serious enough and i had been trying to play it straight and be serious for all these years and what did it got me nothing so i was willing to take a chance on tofurkey and i called up the sandwich maker and they hadn't made that sandwich in like 12 years they were saying we don't care about the name just go for it so i um went and uh, trademarked the name and went out with the first Tofurky Roast, uh, which sold for about $34 in the stores. And they included a three pound stuffed tofu roast that I was buying from Hans and gravy, a tub of gravy. And then we had eight tempeh drumsticks that we made because we had a burger that we were working on that tasted like Thanksgiving more than it tasted like a burger. So we stamped them into the shape of drumsticks. So we didn't know what tofurkeys looked like in the wild, but we knew they had eight legs. So uh, we sold 800 and 
18 of those wild tofurkeys uh, at that point. And inside the box, we put self-addressed stamped postcards because back then, in 1995, about 30 percent of America had um, computers at home. So there really wasn't, you know, a lot of email that you were getting or people were just starting to learn about email as a way of contacting customers. But the majority of people still either called you up on the 800 number if you had one uh, and they or they they wrote you a letter. So we put these postcards in there and we started getting all these amazing, you know, feedback letters and cards coming in that were just like, oh, my God, I've been waiting 20 years for this product. You know, I'm not a second class citizen anymore. I've got something to eat like I can put in the center of my table and cut up just, you know, like it brings me into the uh, Thanksgiving holiday. So we knew then that it was a really um, big deal and that we had found what every marketer dreams of, which we had found a niche that wasn't that was deep and had a lot of emotion and feeling behind it, but it didn't, nobody had served it. And so, um, we slipped in and began to serve it. And I think it just that's great. Changed the, the whole course of my life and the company. And, uh, you know, we became from, we went from being a regional small business to a national small business because there were people all over the country now that suddenly wanted a unique product you know we had something unique <clears throat> that they couldn't buy from anywhere else so that was uh, a big big deal and a big change for us thank you for sharing that mike o'shinner was on the podcast a while back and she was sharing a little bit about how she was able to connect with you and how inspirational you were with her I hadn't heard all that. So thank you for, for walking through that. There are a lot of things that you talked about that I'd love to get into. So flexitarium. A lot of people think that, I remember thinking, you know, I was talking to Gary Hirschberg and we we're teasing about how, you know, before the package usually tastes better than the food, you kind of made reference to that. And yet now, so there's so many great products out there. And a lot of people think that you're a vegan or you're not. The flexitarian thing is really cool because, as you said, people are looking to other protein sources or other sources of food. This is the fastest growing category, the fastest growing trends in in retail. So I talk about the ripple in the pond, and the ripple in the pond is exactly what you're talking about, how you are following those trends and identifying those trends long before they become a tidal wave and end up at a Kroger or a, or a tsunami and end up at a Walmart. But when you're talking about the your relationship to the natural retailers, that's where those ripples in the ponds take full take hold, and that's where you begin to see that. So as you're working with these co-ops, how did you convince them to go down this path? Kind of using your terminology, you didn't have a category, you didn't have a, a, a sustained. Um, you're not following anyone else. You're disrupting the category. You're creating something new and different. How did you get them on board with you? Was it because of the vegan thing? Because of the, the, the relationship with vegans or something else? Well, um, yeah. I mean, we were um, talking to mostly vegans and vegetarians at first, true, because the flexitarian was already, you know, flexing and eating turkey. But uh, it was interesting, like, in the first years, the people that really latched on to Tofurky quickly and bought into it were these co-ops. You know, it was Food Front Co-op in Portland. It was Puget Consumers Co-op in Seattle. And they embraced it because they were uh, selling, you know, pre-selling the holiday turkeys. Like, they didn't have room in their store, so they just – you know, took these special orders. So it was easy for them to put out on their table, like, okay, here's the turkey and here's the tofurkey. Like, you know, take your choice, which one you could do. And that first season in 1995, it became so popular at uh, both those co-ops, but especially Puget Consumers Co-op in Seattle, that they had to put in a tofurkey hotline, an ordering line, 
<clears throat> for people to call in for Christmas and to place their orders. So that was pretty cool. But, you know, going to the fancier uh, natural food accounts of the day, for instance, Nature's was sort of the precursor of Whole Foods in Portland, and they had <clears throat> two or three stores in 1995. And I remember going in there with uh, the Tofurky. And, you know, back then, uh, the kind of, if you looked in the freezer case, you couldn't find anything for more than three ninety nine. Like that was the tops. Like that was considered, you know, what today we would look at and go, uh, you know, like a seven ninety nine or an eight ninety nine product. So three ninety nine was it. And so I was like, oh yeah, and here's this five pound <clears throat> box of food, and you can sell it for thirty four ninety five. And they were like, eh, but you know, I'm I don't know about this, but. I'll take one, but you got to buy it back, you know, if it doesn't sell. And so I'd give them one, and then the next day they'd call and go, well, we sold that one. Can you bring me two more? And it just was Love like it. exponential because nobody knew how much to bring in, you know, at that point in time, either from a store level or from a distributor level. So it was really fighting door to door and, um, you know, when there wasn't – really a buzz about it um just trying to convince stores to take it and you're absolutely right it was really the early adopters were you know the natural food stores and the co-op and you know you always still to this day you appreciate the vision and the um you know the they're they're more willing to take a chance on products and you know you can cut your teeth on this great market and um then you can tell that story to um, bigger grocery chains, and that's exactly what we did. But the first years, you know, was just either selling direct to the consumer before the stores had it, or it was going to these retailers and uh, just convincing them sort of one by one to take it. And pretty soon, you know, I mean, we were getting one of the things, too, is nobody thought that anybody would crazy, be crazy enough to market a tofu turkey, one, or call it a tofurkey. And the name just like, boom, it just caught on with the media. So like that first year, you know, we were getting um, like everything from the Today Show to the Tonight Show and everything in between. And it was just like a f feeding frenzy for the media because they always need a fresh angle on a story. You know, they got to sell the program or the newspapers. So um, it became – we didn't have money at that point to be buying, you know, commercials uh, on TV or even a PR. We didn't have any PR agent, but the name was such a sexy name for people that they just – were flocking and calling and I was putting the Washington Post on hold to talk to the New York Times and it was just like for a small uh, company to break through like that you know from relative obscurity to this hot national disruptive product um, it just changed all of our lives and uh, you know was just this moment that you know the Greeks have a two words for time they have chronos which is chronological time and kairos which is this magic moment where sort of time stands still and you know somebody you look and you say i can finally see my way through and you know i could just start seeing how this would play out through the future so that was my uh kairos moment and from the first tofurkey sold and those feedback cards coming in and calls and letters and tv i was like you know this isn't too bad this is gonna happen so it was an amazing day that's really cool. And that's, I remember all the fun that the late night pundits would have with it. You get a kick out of this. Several years, I went to a Thanksgiving dinner at a friend's house and they had the tofurkey. And I remember the first time I heard the word, it's like, excuse me. And I'm thinking about the gelatinous stuff that falls apart and, you know, old, to old tofu. And uh, anyhow, so they had that on the table and they had that traditional turkey and everyone was turning their nose up at the tofurkey. And yet that was the first thing gone. People were begging for more and the turkey was hardly touched at all. 
And so point being is that, yeah, people, if they try it, if they get past the the funny name and stuff like that, it is a hit. And when you're oh, talking yeah. about flexitarians, there's so many people that are looking for healthier alternatives other than what's out there today. And, you know, whether you're you're an animal activist, et cetera, the long story short, you made a comment somewhere, I'm for, I forget where I heard it, where you feed the amount of food that we have to give an animal and what we get back in return, those aren't equal. And so mm-hmm. one of the big movements within this is let's just go straight to the plant and get those nutrients that need that we need for our body that are in some ways even better. Your thoughts or or how would you describe that? Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, I mean, and that was the whole reason that I became a vegetarian in 1971. I had read Francis Moore LePay's Diet for a Small Planet, which I believe this year or next year is going to come out with its 50th anniversary edition. Wow. It was just like this groundbreaking book because she was the first one to point that out that you know you take 16 pounds of grain and you feed it to an animal and you get as a return uh one pound or less of protein as opposed to feeding it you know like for instance if you give me a pound of soybeans i'll make you two pounds of tempeh wow but you know if you feed one pound to an animal you're going to get one sixteenth or something uh, uh, everywhere from a fifth to a sixteenth greatly reduced amount of protein so that really rang true to me you know because i was a teacher naturalist at that time and i was wanting to save you know wildlife habitat and i was like well if we don't if we make a more efficient protein and we don't you know we can cut like the uh, the farmed land um, impacts by such a great degree, then, wow, you know, wouldn't the planet be better? And now you look at the situation that we're in where, you know, the Amazon's being shredded for um, cattle farms and we're taking away all of this habitat around the world, making ourselves more prone to pandemics like that we're in now, you know, because there's no buffer between the wild animal and the humans and it's just uh like i just my hats off to francis for lapay for having the vision way back in 1971 to um present that fact which is still um you know a, a fact today and now of course there's like you said all these uh nutritional aspects too of eating plant-based and getting the um all the vitamins and minerals and nutrition directly from plants as opposed to uh, the middleman. Cutting out the middleman is one of the key things about business, and that's what we're trying to do here is, you know, go right from the plant without the middleman of the animal uh, right to our bodies. So it's Perfect. it's amazing to see that happening today. Well, and, level and, it is. and what's interesting, and thank you for sharing all this, most people don't know, Seth, where their food comes from. And they don't understand how many gallons of water it takes to make one gallon of milk. How many, you know, all the different things that they have to deal with. Uh, cows were not made to eat grain and hay and some of the stuff that we feed them. And that impacts the food system. And there's so many things that throw it off. And now we're getting into what you're talking about. More of a pure, uh, like you said, cutting out the middleman, giving you that best nutrition and the cool thing is with what you're doing and the movement that you're such a big part of starting is now we're getting even better nutrients, better quality products, more flavors, and we're able to substitute and take the place of some of the things that we grew up with. My grandfather used to love, used to make biscuits and gravy and lived for it. It was great. But that's not the healthiest meal for someone to be eating. And And even though I miss it, there are a lot of great products. Like, for example, some of the things that you guys have come out recently, and I see that now you're making cheeses and things like that. So uh, I definitely want to talk about that. So just quickly about the the, the Plant-Based Food Association, which is the – you were talking to them yesterday. I had told – shared with you I had an opportunity to create a strategy for them, but the reason this matters, strategy in terms of how do you identify what the trends are within that in that segment – and the reason this matters is that ripple in the pond. Most brands, most solution providers, most companies, most retailers don't see how the true impact. 
And so by helping those organizations understand what that means and how you're responsible for driving sustainable sales across every category, that's something we need to work on. But that's where the real opportunity is. And so where I'm going with this, Seth, is you had an idea. You're starving yourself pretty much to bring it to market. And you're not, I mean, it's, I'm sure a lot of people are going, hey, wait a minute, did you ever have second thoughts? And yet you were riding the wave long before there was a wave. How did you, what in the back of your mind caused you to wake up every day and say, you know what, I'm going to go live on just a couple dollars a day or whatever. And I'm going to continue doing this, even though I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Was it just the mission alone? Um, it was uh, two things, really. You know, it was the mission alone uh for the most part you know because i really believed in temp a and in this whole way of living and you know the low on the food chain um bit but it was also uh for me and this is actually very important was i didn't have a plan b you know <laughs> i mean i was living in a tree up in this rural part of um washington state where you know, the the occupational options were like uh, farmer, it was like orchardist, it was like logger. And, you know, there were some maybe a few scattered teaching jobs, but I really didn't want to go back to teaching. So um, this had to work, you know, and uh, having been on that, you know, what Sun Tzu says is death ground where you put your army, uh, you know, on this uh where there's no retreat, you have to like fight or, or perish. And that was kind of the way it was for me. You know, I mean, it, it really had to work. And I've seen like over the years, uh, people like one example is, you know, people that had a, a, a fallback plan, um, fail because of that. Like, you know, there was somebody that I know that, you know, was into the cashew cheese thing before anybody was the first cashew cheese was this wonderful cashew cheese but uh they had another revenue stream in their life and they were just like yeah i'll make some of this this month but then i'm gonna go travel and then i'll come back and make some more cheese and that's a whole different situation than the situation i was in you know because not having a fallback so you really have to uh almost you know there's a point where you just gotta go for it and uh and make it work somehow this had to work because i didn't know what else i would do to be honest and so i think the two of those things kept me going but the mission it was really a big part too you know and and i see that in all these vegan and 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 natural food companies too you know that just about i mean every vegan company that i've seen has a a mission of some kind at some part of their DNA, you know, and uh, that's like a superpower for vegan companies, but also for natural food companies too. You know, there's people making great products. And the nice thing about the mission is that it's always there for you, you know, even when the money isn't. And it keeps you in the game longer, you know, like, I don't know if you're a sports fan, but they talk about, you know, in football games, they say, well, the home team's winning, but this other upstart team is hanging around. It's just hanging around. And that's what it is. You know, I mean, it, you, it keeps you, the mission keeps you hanging around and hanging around and then boom, you know, it keeps you and it makes you to your tofurkey moment or to this moment where you can pivot and things explode and other things happen. You've become less stupid and um, voila, suddenly the playing field's changed and the home team's going, what happened? You know, <laughs> this upstart team. So I think the mission-based businesses are more likely to succeed than non-mission-based businesses. Absolutely. And that's how you became an overnight success after 30, 40 years, whatever. Exactly. So when you were talking yeah. about that, I'm remembering the story about, you know, burning the ship so there's no turning back. Different analogy, but same idea. And on that note, I had my foot kind of in both worlds. I was starting this thing and I wasn't. And, and I had that comfortable possibly, you know, go the other direction. 
And it wasn't until I drew the line in the sand, stepped over it and said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. And that's when I formulated my mission. And my mission is, my mission is to make our healthy way of life more accessible by helping brands like Tofurky get into more store shelves and into the hands of more shoppers, including online. And when I went into this 100%, that's when I launched the podcast and started building out all the content, etc. To your point, it's all about mission-based. And the brands that I see that are really thriving and survive, surviving and then thriving are the ones that have that behind them. Now, what I do for my day job, Seth, is I teach brands how to take their mission and leverage that at retail. Because it's the the mission of the consumer that buys your product that's far more valuable than slotting in the other things that they sell. Especially when you work with mainstream retailers, getting back to that ripple in the pond. So what I mean by that is that the customer that goes into the store that buys Tofurky, they buy a lot of other super premium products. So they're more valuable to the retailer. Customers want to feel good about the products that they buy. So as your customers buy your products, what are the other things that they're buying with your products? And then how do you help leverage that with the retailer to give them a significant competitive advantage? I did a, a webinar, a free webinar a couple of weeks ago with Whole Foods Magazine, where I focused on exactly this, how retailers should demand more from the brands that they sell in terms of the strategies and the insights that no one else is bringing them. So thank you for sharing that. So back to your mission-based brand, how your company culture, let's talk about that for a minute because you having a mission, that's cool. But one of the things I love about natural, one of the things that makes natural natural, as I put it, is that mission is contagious throughout the entire brand, the entire organization. So how did you light that fire or inspire or whatever terminology you want to use, everyone that makes Tofurky? Well, that's a, a great question, you know. Um, and the simple answer is that you just want to be as good to your employees as you can. And, um, you know, we've now become a B Corp, um, which, uh, you know, it forces you um, to be accountable to the interests of your employees um, in concert with your mission of, you know, sustainability and making money and all of the other things you need to do as a business. Um, and but even before we were a B Corp, you know, we just really tried to value um, the employees and, you know, because a we, you know, people often think like, oh, you must have all vegans working at your company. Well, we have over 200 people and we're in a town of, you know, 5,000 people. So it's really uh, not possible. So really what you're trying to do is just trying to um, convince people that this is a, a very sustainable and good benefits and a, and a place, you know, that really is going to take that into account. And, and right now, you know, with the COVID situation, it's become even more critical because, um, you know, a lot of our employees have partners that have been uh, unemployed, you know, due to this job, or then they have kids at home now that aren't going to school. So we've had to really, uh, you know, adapt some of our, our policies. We've brought up our review schedule four months so that people could get more money Good. in their pockets right now. We've raised like uh, a, a whole bunch of um, more money for people. We, we paid more benefits just because we know people are suffering now. And then we're having to work around, you know, some of these um, schedules that people have. So it's really, a uh, you know, a, a place where you want to keep people um, happy and 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 to be honest, you know, another part of our culture really has been kind of this um, lighthearted, fun. You know, it's a fun brand, it's a fun name, but you know, within the company too. You know, we spend so much time working. You you want to have, and it's can be intense. So you want to have lighthearted moments. You want to have a uh, time where people can share a laugh or can, you know, congregate, and not be talking about work. So um, we really try and 
keep it um, light uh, and fun just because we're the otters of the universe and, you know, you want to have fun at, when you have X percent of your life uh, spent at a business. So wherever we can do that, we like to do that. But it's really just, um, you know, and, and we do try and instill, of course, the, uh, you know, the get the concept of veganism and diet and eating better and natural foods um, to people that come to work there. And, you know, a lot of people come and they end up making pretty drastic changes in the way they eat just by hanging out in the culture and eating, you know, meatless Mondays. We do meatless Mondays where we cook meals for everybody and everybody sees, oh, this is great, tasty food, you know. Hmm, maybe I don't need to be eating meat morning, noon, and night, and I can feel better and have a, a better life. So, um, you know, it's it's a lot of the subtle things that you do um, to make uh, a happy and sustainable company. But it all starts on you know, being good to your employees and, and especially, I think, you know, the production level employees um, and, and not just, you know, say managers get something great and better that others don't. You know, we pay everybody's insurance 100 percent and wow. everybody's got 401ks. And it's pretty cool because a lot of these uh, the people that come to us, this is the first time they've ever heard of a 401k or then, you know, they go, what? I've got some money in the bank now for retirement. This is crazy. Or like, oh, I've got, <clears throat> if I get sick, I've, I've got health care and crack health care. So, you know, it's just trying to be respectful. And I think one of the messages of the COVID time is you're seeing who who the real heroes really are now. Uh, you know, it's not just like, you know, we think of heroes, you think of, I don't know, you know, like Phil Knight, Bill Gates, like whatever, you know, but heroic people are, you know, clerks at the grocery stores. They're the production workers at the food plants that are giving the food, you know, the farmers, the, uh, first responders. So it's really, um, great day that you're, they're getting their due. I mean, it's sad that it took a pandemic to make us realize that, but, um, you know, I just have a lot of respect and love for all of the employees and the food service workers and the people who have, you know, not gotten as much due in society as they should have. Thank you for sharing that. And you forgot to include yourself, people that live in a treehouse, et cetera. Just kidding. But but going back to what you said, one of the things that makes it natural natural is our community. And I want to celebrate what you're doing because you're helping people in those situations feel more comfortable or survive and and have that 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 soft landing, whatever terminology you want to use. And people don't realize that the difference, you know, kind of as a segue, when I worked for Unilever, we used to joke about the way to move up in the company was to figure out how to knock off the person in front of you. Kimberly Clark was more of that, 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 what, what you see in natural. So I love that. But what I love about what you're talking about is going beyond and thinking about how do you make an impact, a lasting impact in everybody's life. It's not about Wall Street. It's about Main Street. It's how do you keep that community together. So thank you for sharing that. So inspirational. I want to talk about your book. Before we end, I also gave you an opportunity to ask me what bottleneck I can help you solve. But one of the reasons that we're talking today, and thank you so much for coming on again. I've been looking forward to talking to you for so long now, is tell me about your, tell us about your book. What is the impetus behind it? Why did you decide to write it? And what are you hoping to accomplish? And by the way, I'm enjoying reading it. I haven't finished it yet, but I'm thoroughly enjoying it. So thanks for making it available to me. Oh, yeah. Well, um, first of all, Dan, it, it's a good story looking back, and it's entertaining. I mean, there's a lot of uh, entertainment value in it, so it's a, a good read when you need like a good distractions that hopefully anybody can find um, – you know, humor and insight in, but, uh, beyond that, you know, when I look back at Tofurky and what differentiates Tofurky from a lot of other companies is the fact that this is a family owned and independent business. And, you know, that 
the fact that like I'm still the major shor- uh, shareholder, like after 41 years, the founder is like a still majority shareholder and we haven't sold any equity outside the family. Like that's uh, an unheard of story because uh, right now, you know, we, we grew more like by the debt fan- uh, financing model as opposed to the equity financing model. So uh, I just wanted to tell the story of like illustrate that here's this other model that was really the the only model back in the 1980s, you know, because like as we referenced, there really wasn't a lot of uh, equity financers. There wasn't a lot of money looking to find a home in natural foods. Um, so I wanted to tell the story to other uh, bootstrapper and you know vegan entrepreneurs to give them uh, like a, a vision of like, hey, you know, if a know nothing stupid guy like that can <laughs> end up uh, with the Tofurky Company, which is you know in twenty seven thousand stores worldwide and um, has been kind of this pioneering brand, then maybe. I can too, just by uh, staying the course and turning the key and learning from mistakes and failure and um, just becoming less stupid every day. And so, um, you know, that's, I guess, the two reasons. It's like entertaining read and uh, a model of growth that is different than the current paradigm. Uh, and I'm not against equity financing either. And I understand that, um, you know, they're, they're both valid points, but just uh, giving sort of a, a tale uh, from olden times and how like uh, that can still be out there. Cause there are a lo- lot of, you know, you hear about for every beyond meat and impossible burger, there's like 10 or 15 smaller, you know, startup companies that are just selling their products at a farmer's market or, you know, trying to get going in the natural food channel and they have some great idea and they're just trying to figure it out. So, um, and that's really, I think, one of the uh, heart and souls and key demographics within our business and the natural foods is, you know, because that's where a lot of the innovation happens. You know, you when I go to the... Um, trade show at Anaheim and the Expo West show now, which has, you know, a thousand, four thousand booths or whatever. I love going to the small little um, side show, you know, the exhibits that are in the, um, they're not on the main floor, but they're in the hotels or, you know, the places where there's the new companies are, because that's where, you see innovation and, you know, a lot of times is coming from these new startups that just have an idea and passion and they're giving it a go. So um, I personally just love that and have a, a, a big heart for anybody that's, you know, just starting out and getting going. Thank you for sharing that. I think one of the biggest failings in natural is that we spend so much time telling brands that they need to go raise money and raise more money and raise more money and raise more money without teaching them how to use that money, how to use their intelligence, use these strategies that you're talking about to grow sales. And what I mean by that is that the, you know, the sort of the mindset today is you raise a lot of money and then you hand the the keys to someone else to run your business for you. Here you are bootstrapping, making it work, And again, overnight success, just kidding. But you know what I'm getting at as far as you had a plan, you had a mission, you stuck with it, you burned the ships, you however you want to put it. And as a result, you succeeded. And I think that story is so inspirational. And so, you know, for everyone, I certainly want to recommend that you that they read in search of the wild tofurkey. I'll be certain to put a link to it in the podcast show notes and on the web page. Thank you for sharing all that. And thank you for for your insights because this, to me, this is why I do this. This is why I get excited, kind of going off on a tangent a little bit. But I love talking to people like you that look beyond the traditional ways of, the, the, the way that a lot of people do things. You know, the old strategies that your grandfather used won't be successful today. What I mean by that is big brands can buy velocity. There's more important things than velocity. 
and getting back to the customer, the customer that'll spend a premium to buy your product, a customer that wants to align themselves with a mission-based brand. So thank you for sharing all that. Any other comments that you want to make? And then, of course, I'd love to hear what your bottleneck is if I can help you solve it. Uh, no, you know, I, I think this has been a wide-ranging interview and you brought up some points that no other interviewers have. So I think I applaud you for Thanks. your insights onto the natural food industry and into um, plant-based foods as well. Um, you know, the yeah, the book link will be very helpful. You know, in terms of bottlenecks, um, you know, right now uh, we've had to, you know, reinvent our uh, production lines in terms of uh, social distancing, you know, because a lot of food processing is like small groups of people huddled around uh, machines and putting stuff in packages and whatnot. And so that's been like a challenge. And Jamie uh, Athos, who's my stepson and is now the president and CEO and doing a great job of being on top of you know, keeping employees safe and, you know, getting food out the door because the orders now are have basically doubled okay. in March and April with everybody trying to bring in more products so that uh, they can, you know, don't have to go to the store so much and they're in quarantine. Um, <clears throat> and this isn't like a bottleneck per se right now, but I do think that, you know, when I look at the company, um Succeeding in food service, like we've been really a retail brand, you know, focused um, for the most part and haven't done as well, good a job, you know, as we could have in uh, food service. So, you know, that would if it's a bottleneck, I don't know, you know, bottleneck, but it's it's an area where I think there's uh, untapped growth potential in the Tofurky company. Tremendous. Thank you for sharing. So while you're talking about what is the bottleneck, my first thought was, what is the natural equivalent to bubble wrap and duct tape? Just kidding. In other words, bubble wrap your people because they're so close together. I, I have visions of, I see on the nightly news, all the people next to each other in the pork, pan, pork processing plants and thinking, how in the world do you that's such a difficult place to be in anyhow, just to do the same thing over and over again for many hours a day. Um, but to answer your question, I believe you need to be wherever your customer shops, wherever your customer is. So the answer to your question is, and this actually, you know what, I wish I would have brought this up or dug, dug more into this. The fact that you had the wherewithal to create a postcard, self stamp postcard, and reach out to people to get true social insights, not social insights, customer shopper insights. That is absolutely brilliant. Hats off to you. Most brands struggle to do that, and most brands rely heavily on sources for that kind of information that aren't that good. What I mean by that is focus groups tend to tell you what you want to hear versus what you want to know. So leverage that mindset. Develop a community offline within your brand. So if I have an email address, I give it to you, you give me a recipe or something or somehow invite me into that community. So a couple things, really good question, Seth. One, if I have a community or build a community around you, then you can leverage that so I can help you with innovation and things like that, answering some of these specific questions that you've asked. Number two, you can leverage that community to help drive sales wherever you need, wherever the opportunity is. And when you're talking about food service, getting into food service is sometimes difficult because of the transition. Who do you know? How do you make that, that transition? And so when I'm thinking back, the illustration that I gave you before, here's that weird looking thing on the Thanksgiving table that everyone turned their nose up and yet that was the first thing we ate. So how do you build awareness? Every opportunity that you have to get in front of a retailer or a buyer should be an educational opportunity, one. And then two, as you're leveraging your community, ask your community, where do they want to see you? And ask your community, do you know how we can get in there or what suggestions do you have? So let's say military or let's say some of the other um food service opportunities. For example, the my next door neighbor, 
um, has puts up a booth at different, I'm trying to think of how to put it, like events and stuff like that. One of those where they sell turkey legs and stuff like that. Well, you know what? I'm going to go tell them about Tofurky because I think that'd be a great offering. So leverage your community. Identify who are the people that can connect you in those groups. How do you start making inroads in there? And so what I'm getting at is if you own, and I, and I, I, I didn't mean this in this way. I mean, okay, let me put it this way. I've always said that if all the retailers dried up tomorrow, who would you sell your product to? Had no idea that we'd have a pandemic. Same mindset. If all the retailers disappeared, who would you sell your product to? If if you had a community, you could leverage the strength of that community when you're selling online as well as in a traditional store as well as in food service. And so the answer to your question from my standpoint is find a way to build a, a loyal community around your brand outside of traditional retail. Leverage that to get the insights, it's every, everything that you need to be able to support that, your story, your brand story, and then leverage that to get your product or introduce your product into those non-traditional areas like food service. Does that help? Yeah, you know, uh, I think it does, and I, I uh, totally agree, you know, and we, about the customer and developing the community and, you know, because people, uh you, you want to keep your evangelical followers, you know, happy and involved and engaged because, um, and honestly, um, one of the values of growing like we were able to grow was I've done every job here, you know, including like in the early days of Tempe, I would go out to stores and I would do be sit there in the back and I was doing Tempe demos and that is just to your point, you know, it is like direct feedback that's invaluable. It's not like a, a paid focus group that is, you know, it's, it's better than that because here's somebody tasting your product and they're just, you can see in their face, are they throwing it out? Are they going, wow, are they sharing it to say, can I take some for my friends? And, you know, getting that feedback uh, from customers is just in, the DNA now. So, Good. you know, like I feel sorry sometimes for people in a way, if they started out like, Oh, before I've even sold one unit, I have a million dollars like, and I've never even touched or made it. I mean, I've produced tempe on the line. So I, I have this empathy for workers, you know, um, and I have this um, contact because I was in customer service. I was answering, all the phones and emails at one point, you know, and then I fired myself as I went along and got bigger. And that was a key point too. You know, you got to know when to fire yourself. And every time I fired myself, by the way, things got better because (laughs) it was just, you had a pro now that was living and breathing sales. It wasn't like I was doing sales, but I was also doing marketing. I was also overseeing production. I was logistics, you know, so uh, firing yourselves, important but um you're absolutely right you know having the the feedback from the consumer and developing that community and maintaining that community which now of course you have the social media uh avenue to do that and to engage them um more so thank you for that um well, bringing thank that you. out that advice Thank you. And and this kind of goes back to what I was saying a minute ago. You know, I think that our biggest failing is the way we, we bring these new brands along. Go raise money. Then we teach you to raise money. Then we teach you to raise money. And then we teach you that your strongest, your biggest asset, your greatest asset is your checkbook. And you get in front of a retailer and say, sit down, shut up, get out your checkbook. That doesn't work. But yet, if we can teach you how to leverage that community, how to leverage that customer, how to leverage those insights, how to roll up your sleeves and demo the pro all the things that you've talked about, the things that are in your book, et cetera, that's how we make a difference. That's how we own that ripple in the pond. And that's how we help these natural retailers grow and thrive. That's how we help more of these natural brands continue to succeed. So thank you for sharing that. All right. You got a great story. Thank you. Yeah, and it's, uh, well, you have a lot of uh, insight, you know, certainly into natural foods, you know, a whole Thanks. career and uh, of doing branding. So it's very uh, 
instructional to hear, you know, your viewpoints. And uh, like I said, you know, I mean, this was, uh, you know, a a good interview because I've been doing a fair number of interviews lately. And, you know, some of them don't go uh, as deep as you did and, you know, bring up different points and different things that I hadn't thought about in a while. So that's the sign of a good interview. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on and thank you for reaching out to me. This has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I look forward to our next conversation and hopefully get a chance to meet someday in the near future. Absolutely, Dan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to thank Seth for coming on today and for sharing his insights and his wisdom. I also want to thank Seth for sharing information about his book, for coming on the podcast today and putting it out there. More importantly, for writing the book in the first place. I've started reading it. I love it. It's a great book. You're definitely going to want to read it too. In Search of the Wild Tofurky. I'll be starting to put a link to the book and how you can get it on the podcast webpage and in the show notes. Today's free downloadable guide is what is category management and why is it important? We touched on this a little bit during the podcast episode. Category management is something that's overlooked and underutilized in the natural channel. In fact, the big brands, while they rely heavily on it, they don't use it to its full potential. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to teach you the best strategies in terms of category management and how to gain a competitive advantage when you're working with any brand. In other words, how to level the playing field between you and your most sophisticated counterpart, your competitor. More importantly, this is what retailers really want and need from you. They want brands willing and able to step up and help them with strategies that other brands are overlooking. They want insights, actionable insights that other brands aren't providing them. You can get that on the podcast webpage and in the show notes, as well as the link to Seth's book by going to brandsecretsandstrategies.com slash session 185. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.